Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Sonic Frontiers playthrough. Look at those wide open spaces. They're so beautiful. <laughs> oh boy, we're at that point in the commentary. Huh? <laughs> 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 now we start doing the play by this, play. Sonic stomping on the This thing. is why. This is why. <laughs> Swing and a miss, buddy, multiple times. Holy this shit. This is why we would not be able to do a, a Breath of the Wild commentary. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I. It won't be for years, but I think we can do it when we're very desperate. Or we're just really bored. I don't know. You know, I think ultimately it, it, we'll, we'll, we'll probably end up skipping Breath of the Wild 1 and just go straight to Tears of the Kingdom, which seems like it has more dynamic stuff layered on top of the open world, to be honest. Too early to say. Well, I mean... <laughs> Just the stuff that they've shown It could very off. well just be a larger Breath of the Wild. <laughs> well, they've, they've shown off some of the mechanics and stuff in the trailers. They've been admirably restrained in their marketing for this game. I, I, I will never let them live down how they literally showed us like all of the exciting cutscene pieces in uh, the trailers for Breath of the Wild. But uh, the stuff they have showed is, you know, impressive. Like, they seem to have taken the idea of building a spacecraft out of the head of a guardian and a raft and, you know, just gone full nuts and bolts with it. <laughs> <laughs> that was like an immediate comparison of everyone saw trailer. Nobody just... likes 3D adventure games anymore. Vehicles. Vehicles is what everyone wants. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, to talk about the game we're actually playing right now. Uh, no. You ever had brain freeze? <laughs> <laughs> no, that actually, time. if we were talking about the game we were actually playing right now, it would be the Resident Evil 4 Chainsaw demo. Uh, this was months ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for context, like, when we, we, we finished the, the last recording session, we had a brain freeze tangent, and then one of the parts that we uploaded earlier in that week also had a brain freeze discussion, and, when, and I say, like, we, we seriously had two brain freeze tangents without even fucking realizing Well... That. As it happens, there was also an audio glitch in that recording, and I had to patch in some audio post hoc to cover it up, so I referenced the earlier <laughs> tangent. Um, so some people might be wondering why you brought that up, as if you don't know that I mentioned it. It's because I didn't mention it when we were actually in the commentary together. <laughs> I forgot. That's what happens when a whole week of, of, of empty space separates these commentary sessions, you know? We forget what we talked about, and then we just end up kind of throw it off. Yeah, we end up talking about the same thing more than once because it occurs to us more than once. Yeah, you know, it's been a while since we had a breath of the wild tangent. <laughs> uh, I, you know, the tangent I really want to go on at this moment is Resident Evil Four remake, but the but we're in an awkward space where it's five days before release, so by the time this comes out, the game will already be out, and everyone will know much more about it than I know right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I am seriously looking forward to that, though. Yeah, that's am I. The demo seriously impressed me. If they can carry that tonal balance through the entire game, it's gonna be, it's gonna be one for the ages. Ah, but of course, I failed both the ring challenge and the S reg challenge in the same attempt which means like I have to do this at least twice more because no way am I getting both of these those done in the same go. <laughs> yeah, so uh, is this our first cyber stage, stage in the island? My I believe be. it I believe it is. I'm not sure if we did one in the previous session or not, but yeah, so in a change of pace, finally <laughs> or could have come sooner if you ask me. Uh the cyberspace levels in the 5th island are completely original. Uh they are not based on any other game. Uh, in the series, and I think they are better for it. I actually really like the flavor space levels in this game, and in this island specifically. Oh, I managed to get the S rank and the last red star ring in the same in the same go. You think you died, so, so you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I also <laughs> forgot which of the two missions that I didn't that I didn't um, manage to get through in the first in the first run. So, oops. Four vault keys. I could only assume that. They just had, they only had the brain power to think of a handful of original level designs for the boost formula. I wouldn't. S While all of their attention was just 
on the island exploration. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of an issue of design bandwidth. And you know, I don't really begrudge them that too much because when you're designing a game, you do kind of have to like budget your resources and time so that you can yeah. you can cover what's important. Because if you don't, you get awkward stuff like fucking Baldur's Gate 2. Great game. Highly recommended. Uneven as fuck. <laughs> where the de- where the designers just sort of got enamored with any particular bit of content that they that they were especially interested in making and as a result by the end of the game that the, they 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 had to like they had to they had to um, really clamp down on development to make sure everything got finished on time and one of the interesting things about that is like one of the major complaints with Baldur's Baldur's Gate 2 is that there are three really well developed romance options for male player characters and one really shitty one for all the female players <laughs> so the reason for that is okay originally they were going to do three for both genders but the people in charge of doing Jahira's quest line got so involved in writing interesting content for her that it just sort of became a design a designer's nightmare full of like bugs that needed fixing on top of more bugs that needed fixing and all of that. So the guy who was supposed to be writing the male romances had to had to put it, put those aside and go help with the Jahira content. And um, that's why all we got was Anamen. Anamen is terrible. Nobody likes Anamen. Literally, no one. <laughs> so this is the new. This is the new sitcom. <laughs> if you thought you liked it, it's Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> He's terrible. But uh, okay, so yeah, that's a thing. And I just brought that up as an example because it's the first one that came to mind. Because I'm playing Baldur's Gate two at the moment, but like, it can happen with any game. So like you really do need to be careful about how you manage these things, especially when time is an issue. One of my favorite examples of doing this right is actually Mass Effect 2. Like, talk about a masterclass and how to do a lot with very little, because if you actually, like, squint at the game and examine the moving parts, it's a lot of cut-copy-paste content with, like, hallways full of barrels and cover walls and shit. There's not a whole lot of interesting design in the levels themselves. Probably because EA had just bought them out and they realized they wouldn't have time for that shit. So they focused on, like, really... on making a really focused character action adventure. That Why did I say character action? That's a genre now. Ugh. Oh boy. <laughs> they they focused on they, they they made a really focused adventure that focuses on its characters and its action and it's it's considered a classic or at least it was considered a classic. People have probably cooled off on it by now, but for a long time it was considered like the best in the series. Which is giving it too much credit, but it's still a really solid game, and that... <laughs> I was like, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but... <laughs> and at the same time that they were making Mass Effect 2, they made Dragon Age 2, which has, like, all the problems that Mass Effect 2 avoided, plus a few others. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, compare the two games, seriously. It's, 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 a really, it's a really poignant lesson in the importance of managing your time as a game designer. Um... Aren't they like two completely different games though? Isn't that kind of apples and oranges? Not really, because well, for one thing, Dragon Age Two like absorbed a lot of Mass Effect's DNA in its own streamlining process. So, like through a Bendy. Well, I mean, they stole. Well, I I can't say they stole it. It's the same company and developers, but they took the Mass Effect dialogue system and transplanted it into Dragon Age. Um, and they also focused a lot on characters, character loyalty missions, and that kind of stuff in their design. So it's clear that they were taking a lot of influence from what people liked in the Mass Effect games. But the game was not nearly as graceful in its execution. It was hideously rushed. 
kind of broken at launch, although they did fix the, the, the most obvious bugs in patches later on. I, I, I clearly remember playing the, the game for the first time, and when I got to Act 3, there was a quest NPC on the beach area that just broke completely. If you played Dragon Age 2, you probably know the one, but, like, yeah, it was kind of a mess. And that's on top of it being a game that uses the same natural cave formation for, like, seven separate caves around the area. So, I never maxed out my stats uh, for Sonic. I never found my found the need yeah. to, but uh, I never really caught the Coco lines when you when you capped out all your stats so for both sides. Oh, yeah. Because uh, uh, they, they go on about... Uh, mentioning that, you know, if only we had someone like you, <laughs> like, or the collaborator sort of thing, but it's like, we know a time traveler, but, you know, we're just gonna let it be. I never caught that time traveler line. <laughs> uh, That'll get the fucking theory spinning. The guy's, the guy's kind of right about, like, not doing time travel, though, because, like, um, like, if, if they change the, 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 the history of the planet that much, the result would be, like, Literally all of the species and all of the characters, at the very least, would be radically changed and or erased. Standard butterfly effect. Yeah. You know, well, that's, that's all it is. You go back that far and change the history of the planet, the result is like a Chrono Trigger bad ending where the dinosaurs rule the world, you know? Bad ending, you say. <laughs> <laughs> or you just go to the developer room and talk to Toriyama and uh, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Nobuyo Matsu, Toriyama, uh, Sakaguchi. But like, my point is, you know, Sonic just clearly wasn't thinking when he suggested that. <laughs> no, I don't think it was. Wait, it was, that was, El- oh, wait, was it Sonic saying I that? It was Elder Coco saying that. I thought it was the other Coco saying. Nah, it was Sonic saying that. Well, that's the what that's Sonic? the problem okay. with these inexplicably unvoiced dialogue exchanges. Yeah, because they weren't they weren't labeled as such. I thought it was the other Coco saying it. Because if it's Sonic saying it, then he's probably referring to Silver. Uh, yeah, he's but... referring to Silver. Hmm. Huh, okay. Um. the The thing about the thing about the the dialogue between Sonic and the Elder Cocos is that I think it was added very late in development. So. After the point where they'd had all the voice work already done. So that's why it's so awkwardly included. But, you know. I can... uh, Since I'm in full-on I can dream mode right now as far as Sonic the Hedgehog can go. uh, Goes, um... I don't know, I can dream. Maybe they'll add voice acting for those lines later and it won't be so awkward for people playing this in the future. Let us know in the comments about a year from now. I don't know what exactly I want with the DLC. You know, I, I'm kind of at a, like at a point where whatever they give, I'll I'll take and I'll judge after. But I don't exactly have an idea of what I would want to see. Well, it, it's hard to think of a definitive list of expectations when the when the gameplay style is so. Well, I mean, if you're a Sonic tuber, <laughs> you'll make one. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, there's always more motivation when money is involved. But, like, okay. Yeah. So. Look forward to Johnny's round two video in the, in the fall. <laughs> uh, see, no, I, I don't do that sort of thing. I'm not a Sonic tuber. Like, I'm known for my Sonic videos, but you don't see me making top ten things I want to see in Sonic Frontiers DLC. Not judging for the record. It's just that that's not who I am. I was more talking about around two when then all the DLC is out and you... Oh well, yeah, well, like well, yeah, well, like yeah, so that's when I would revisit it, sure. Uh, but I don't really make anticipation videos. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's fine to make that kind of content if you've got the kind of personality to make it engaging. But yeah. there, there's a serious danger of those that kind of anticipation content becoming utterly and completely redundant within itself. <laughs> but it could also be hilariously outdated, too. Because, like, think about it. You make the video at first, and you got the initial comments saying, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And then years later, when it sounds like you're being wrong, and they come back and say, yeah, you dipshit, you're well, wrong. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a glass half-empty way of looking at that, yeah. But, I, I, but sometimes I like to go back and watch those kind of videos anyway, at least the good ones. 
to get a sense of to get a sense Wait, for the. Hold on, you say glass half empty. You say glass half empty. No, no, no I'm talking about. I'm talking. I'm talking. I'm talking strictly. I'm talking strictly in terms of engagement. That's a that's glass half full. Well, strictly <laughs> in terms of engagement is glass half empty. But like, I like to go back and watch those kind of videos, the good ones anyway, because they provide an yeah. interesting snapshot of the history of a game's pre-release period. Yeah, I would agree. What was that challenge, by the way? Platforming. Just up on platforms. We're at the back yeah. end of the game, and their idea of a map challenge is here's some slow-moving platforms in a staircase formation. Jump up them with an extremely generous timer. Come on. Guys, we've been playing this game for 23 parts. <laughs> and that's... and that's Why not make it 24? That's with the editing. <laughs> so, like... <laughs> I think we can take take on a little bit more at this point. How much damage are you going to ask me to do? Oh, no, this isn't a damage. No, this, is a, this, is a, this is a time trial. Yeah. Oh, jump through some hoops. Well, again, this, go, this, this probably goes into the idea that Island 1 and 5 were meant to be 1, so maybe some challenges that were meant to be in Island 1 just bled over into Island 5 without considering the swing in difficulty. Or lack thereof. Maybe, but I also get the sense that a lot of the challenges were built on top of the island later rather than when the island was initially designed. Because the longest the longest thing for the designers to to do, I wound up getting bounced back and then panic sidestepping <laughs> through the rails. Um what the whoopsie doodle. What the hell just happened? <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Focus, Lewis. Focus. It's like it's like <laughs> the physics of the game, and you know where the checkpoint puts you halfway through the course, so you have to run all the way back to start it. Thanks, game. Ugh. Okay, so uh, the longest thing that it would that it would take to design at any given point on these islands is the base island itself, right? You know. The landmass, so, yeah. the landmarks, all the different areas. They'd have to take a lot of time with that. The level design material that's built on top of it is by and large, though, made of, like, prefab parts, you know? They're the copy-paste elements. What the? <laughs> okay. It almost what happened again. that time? My point is, like, that's the stuff that they can easily adjust later in, de later in development. And I really don't think that, like, a situation like this, for example, would have been designed for the first island. This is actually, like, some pretty involved uh, boost era platforming. But... At the same time... <laughs> It feels like they didn't have a solid sense of where their difficulty balance was supposed to stay. So the game sort of jumps all around the spectrum from easy to hard to middle to... I would say more in the case of this island than in any other island. Yeah, maybe. It might also be that they had a more non-linear structure in mind earlier in development. And some of the stuff was designed around that. Like, maybe you weren't supposed to be stuck on a single island at any one point. That you could just, like, freely hop between them, you think? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Also, like, the, the whole uh, the underwater uh, element of this game is never used, uh, to my knowledge, outside of potentially drowning with one enemy. Like, you have an oxygen meter... But there is never any real need to be underwater for any reason. The only place where it, where it ever has any like likelihood of coming up in a significant way is that is that one big lake on Island Two, where you have to drain the the, the lake. Yeah. Y you might be inclined to jump in there to explore before you realize that you need to drain it. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and if you do that, you are very likely to die. Like, it is possible to, to make your way out, but visibility is so poor down there that you're not likely to find it. So, um, you might drown there, but that's about it. 
but never at any point in the game in the island or in the or in cyberspace actually and i think about it too never challenges you uh underwater like other sonic games would i get the feeling that they created that mechanic before they had decided whether or not they would use significant water areas yeah like they had sonic's base you know capabilities and stuff all settled and then they started designing the islands and it feels like this sonic is meant to be somewhat all-purpose like he needs to have a drowning mechanic so that they know what will happen if they use water in any game after this <laughs> not necessarily just this game so this is where I found out that boosting doesn't hurt enemies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the um, this is the level that's most likely to. Also, this isn't totally original. This is very much. Oh, this is classic Sonic. Uh, uh, chemical plant. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I might be misremembering because I don't think I did every cyberspace level on the island because I'm at this point I just did big fishing for everything. <laughs> Well, I'm the kind of player who at least wants to play all of the levels in a game, even if the game lets me. I don't know. It depends you know, on if I find them, them enjoyable. <laughs> well, if I don't find them enjoyable, I'm just going to stop playing the game. Yeah. I'm not going to bother. Well, finish. I mean, like, yeah, it, it, in terms of, like, side content. Well, yeah. But I mean, like, I'm not the kind of player who can play Mario 64 and say skip the annoying clock tower stage just because I have enough power stars to complete the game. Yeah, I'm gonna play the clock tower stage, <laughs> <laughs> and just nothing you can do about it. <laughs> I might, I might grumble a bit about how annoying the power stars are to get in that level, but I'm, I'm gonna well, that, do it. Is, is it. Is it so much that you just like completing the game, or is it? because you don't like the idea of skipping something in a game. And I know that sounds like, isn't that the same thing? But no, I think the mentality is different. It's because I want to experience all of what a game has to offer, you know? Uh, it depends on the game for me. I, for Mario 64 specifically, like I, I'll agree that despite being able to fight Bowser's uh, final fight with just 70 stars, I still play every stage in the game. Yeah. And, um, like, how do I put this? Um, if I know that there's, a, that there's substantial content, I definitely want to see what's what over there. And in Mario 64's case, I already have enough of a beef with the game's emphasis on weird random objectives over platforming. Yeah. So I'm not going to skip one of the only dedicated platforming levels in the game, you know? <laughs> um, like... Uh, like, I don't think I ever play a, Mar a 3D Mario game without ever going for all the collectibles, including Sunshine. Except for Sun... Oh, you yeah. including Sunshine? I guess the easiest way to put it would be skipping a Power Star feels like skipping a Power Star... Skipping a level feels like skipping a chapter in a book. Um, I think if for for uh, yeah, I guess it's kind of the same thing. It's just I really like this game. I want to I want to play more of the game. You know. Yeah. Well, it's like you know I don't feel compelled to do all of the side quests in a big RPG, but I do at least feel compelled to visit all of the key locations and talk to. All the all of the people and find out what there is to find out about the world. So I guess it's more that I appreciate the experience of going through the clock level more than I appreciate the experience of doing all the quests there. Um, and uh, I find it neat that the clock level has different states based on when you jump into the painting. That's cool. But uh, I could have done without the, you have to get a different star at different levels of, of the clock, and then you always have to start at the bottom again. And so you're playing the same level multiple times. 
<laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yeah, but this star is on the left platform when previously it was on the right. Mario 64 had a lot of first game and serious problems. And I don't wanna I don't wanna say that like I'm trashing Mario 64. <laughs> because some people no, some people get really high and mighty about telling people who like old games, ah, oh, you're letting nostalgia get to you. This game has aged like crap. Yeah, it's aged like crap. It was still a great game. Who cares? You can critique something and still like it. Well, you, you yeah, but you can also like a game can be old and still be good. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Games don't become don't magically become bad because they've aged. They just become harder <laughs> for newer players to get into. That's a, there's a difference. There was a time when on this very commentary channel I griped about how I could not get into the Ultima series because I just could not gel with the controls. But enough about yesterday. <laughs> I still can't gel with the controls, but they're still great games. I'm, I'm, I'm just like you know, I, I see what what they did right now, <laughs> on top of the things that bothered me, and I appreciate them more for it. Uh now if I remember correctly, on this island there was a lot of residential stuff, right? Yes, we believe we talked. It about was that, uh, it was this and the island four also had residential stuff too. Yeah, this is a, a village. I think a few of the sage cutscenes involve talking about them. Not that we'll find out because all of the sage cutscenes cost an arm and a leg on this island. <laughs> this is prime real estate, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's no one here. Now, I do have an issue with all of the buildings on this island being stone ruins. I understand why it is, because they would need to, like, be made of something pretty sturdy to have lasted over 10,000 years like this. But I kind of wish there was a bit more diversity in the, in the ancients, like, style of architecture. When you consider, like, they seem to be a highly advanced race, and they rely on stone. <laughs> Well, it's not so much that. It's like, you know... Well, it's more like they just rely on stone. Like, you can spice it up a bit by having different sort of uh, extraterrestrial, out-of-this-world elements to it. In fact, because stone seems very mundane. It's more that actual civilizations have multiple things that they make stuff out of. Yeah. And they do it for different purposes. You know, they'll have big stone pyramids, but they'll also have... You know, a different style of architecture for their for their residentials, and they'll have another different style of architecture for their government buildings. And, and I was gonna say, like, like the, 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 the ancients got to work on their game. If the three little pigs are more technologically advanced <laughs> in their storybook series, and there will be certain structures that are built to last, and there will be other structures that are not built to last, and those will be made of different things and in different styles and using different building techniques. And there's none of that with the uh, with, with the ancients. And I realize that this is a heavy criticism to love a fucking Sonic the Hedgehog game. But since they went there, I'm going to bring it up. You know, um, it it's kind of nonsensical that the residential buildings would have lasted this long at all. So they probably should have come up with a more subtle way to imply that this area here was residential than to just have stone houses made of the same stuff that the, that the ancients built everything else out of. Uh, maybe a long time ago it was, but, you know, time takes a lot of things away, wears it down. Well, yeah, but, like, it's it's not like there's nothing to work with it to, uh, when it comes to figuring out how to portray this. Yeah. Like, even if a building itself did not last, it would still leave evidence behind of its existence. So we don't need to see the house. We just need to see, like, what's left over of its foundations, you know? I mean, that's assuming nothing else happened around the island that wouldn't cause, like, everything to just go fucking down under. Well, if you're yeah, just talking but... about if the island only suffering you know natural wear and tear throughout the generations and yeah i would agree but who knows if other things have happened before you know sonic and company arrived there yeah 
But, you know, there is at least more room to suspend your disbelief with regard to that. Um, but one of the things they could have done, which they didn't, but it would have been cool if they did, was if during the flashbacks that show the ancients themselves, they showed the houses and stuff fully constructed as they would have looked at the time. And then we saw something extremely, like, vestigial in the present day. I feel like this is the kind of consideration that they would have made if they didn't have to spend quite so much time in production just making sure the game had a solid foundation to run on and had more time to build the game's world, you know? And it's not, like, super important for a Sonic game. Yeah, yeah, I know. Who plays Sonic for the story, blah, blah, blah. That old hat. But, you know, that's, there's nothing stopping them from going above and beyond and maybe making it a game that you play for the story. Which, I should note, they've already kind of succeeded at doing, even with the shoddy execution here in the finished product. So, you know. I guess I'm just imagining what could have been. Oh, so you are a Sonic tuber. <laughs> uh, 